right, uh, I'll accept the motion to approve that trip. So moved. Second. <coughs> Any other discussion? Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Okay. Um, the second item is C. Uh, we, we can take C1 through 6 as a consent. I'll take a motion for C1 through 6. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Okay. Uh, and um, another item on the personnel is the approval of the tentative agreement with OPSI uh, Local 102. I'll accept a motion to approve that. So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? <coughs> Questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Posh. <laughs> yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Okay. And I'll accept a motion to, for the approval of the Heights Public Library alternate tax budget. Uh, that's D1. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I'll just note that as the taxing authority for the library, you're required to pass the uh, tax budget much as we have our own tax budget that we pass. And it's simply the library um, asking the county to provide all the income uh, or property taxes that they're entitled to uh, for their operations. So you see the detail of the tax budget. It just lists by funds the, the appropriations and their intended use for the money. Any questions, comments? Okay, Jim and uh, Eric are real familiar with this. They are indeed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Seven years ago. Uh, <laughs> a couple of years ago, yeah. Um, Mr. Kane, what you call the vote? Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. And I believe I can take D2 through 9 as uh, mm -hmm. one motion. Uh, some financial issues. I'll accept a motion to approve those. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I'll just note that these are the um, end of the year uh, kinds of things that we have to do in terms of uh, appropriation adjustments, uh, stale dated checks, all those kinds of things the auditors want us to do. So fortunately this meeting fell right at the right time, which is why we squeezed those items on here. Uh, at the end of the fiscal year, and also temporary appropriations for the next fiscal year um, that are just an estimate based on prior fiscal year and they expire in October, we'll bring a permanent appropriation uh, for you in September. Um, and I think that is it. Mostly, mostly audit, uh, auditor type requests for us to do these things at the end of the fiscal year. Any questions? Okay, Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Zucker. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dixon. Okay, so tonight's agenda the items and we have them on the screen. The, we're going to discuss the purpose of this work session, the current status of the master facilities plan, phase one, factors that led us to this point, the current path for middle school renovations, alternative paths for middle school renovations, and our next steps are going to be the items that we're going to talk about tonight. So with that, I turn it um, to you, President Register. Okay. Um, so we um, actually, as a board and, and um, administration, scheduled this meeting um, 
because we wanted to do, number one, due diligence on the middle school project. And there was some conversation going back and forth. And even um, some rumors related to that. So we wanted to make sure to have the opportunity for us all to be in a room together and have a conversation uh, related to this. We think it's our job to uh, do the best that we can by the resources that the community has uh, entrusted to us. So we know that there was a master's uh, facilities plan, but we also know that there is some conversation and some change, some things have changed since we first passed uh, issue 81. And so we thought we'd open this process up again, hear where the community is, and then uh, deliberate and make um, some decisions. So that's kind of where we are. No decisions outside of what was in the original master plan has been made. There have been some discussions, but absolutely no decisions. <coughs> so first of all, uh, I think we uh, all want to acknowledge that we ended up spending more money on our monument on uh, Cedar Road uh, than we had initially anticipated, and that's due to a lot of reasons. I think some of you who have been uh, staying close to the ground know about that. Um, unforeseen conditions, uh, issues with soil, issues with um, steel beams that we thought were in good shape that were absolutely um, had to be replaced. So we ended up um, uh, spending more money on the high school and even uh, Wiley than we had anticipated. So now we have, as a result of that, about $30 million in hard costs that we have to deal with the, the middle schools with. And so what has happened is we as administration and board have had some conversations back and forth and with the architects and so on, trying to figure out um, kind of what options we have. But again, those are conversations that we had begun to have without making it any definite and we ran and continue to run, and we'll hear some more tonight, but we have run and continue to run various scenarios uh, to make that work. So we're gonna listen to some tonight. Um, the education service team has put a lot of work into just kind of sorting through and seeing what our options are, uh, seeing uh, what, what, I like what Cal always says, he, says let's do what's best for the kids. Let's do best what's best for our students and make sure that they're the 21st students that we can all be proud of. And as we get older and older and older, we got somebody that's gonna carry on our legacy. So that's where we are. Um, and uh, hopefully tonight, as far as the board is concerned and the administration, this is a beginning conversation as opposed to and end in conversation. And it's really important for everybody to have that in their head. Other opportunities are gonna come up where you will be able to participate and talk to us about <coughs> what your thoughts are. So I'm gonna turn it back over to um, Dr. Dixon and her team. Okay, all right, thank you, Ron. So I don't wanna introduce um, the others who are sitting here with us so that you know who's speaking. So we have Felicia Gould, who's our Assistant Superintendent of Ed Services, Bob Swagger, the direct, Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Brad Callender, Director of Career and Technical Education, Pat O'Brien from PMC um, Owners Rep, and then we have George Peckett, who is our Director of Business Services. So they will be assisting in this presentation tonight. So as Ron um, stated, um, some of the factors that led us here tonight also I uh, would be remiss if I didn't um, take ownership for part of that as well. Um, I asked the board back in April, a little prior, to allow us to make a presentation to them um, a second time. I think I came back, to, came to them, I believe last year, and, and stated, um, let's look at five, six, seven, eight. And at that time, the board listened but I wasn't confident that that was the right choice. And so I take full ownership for that last year. 
However, when I went back um, and looked at our, our, our CHUH mission statement, um, and I thought about that mission statement, and that mission statement describes our purpose of our organization as a whole, and it addresses why we exist. Um, many of you know in the fall of 2014, our staff, our community stakeholders and students embarked on a strategic plan and in that strategic plan we decided that we wanted a new mission. And that new mission just outlines that our schools provide a challenging and engaging education to prepare our students to become responsible citizens and succeed in a college and career. And I, as the leader of this organization, reflected on that and said, am I pushing the right decision and making sure that that is the mission of our district and stand in the same configuration when we have the opportunity to do something different? I further looked at our, our values statements. The <coughs> value statement is something that we also integrated into our um, new strategic plan. And when we think about our value statements, um, it addresses the question of who we are as an organization and what do we believe in. And we've stated that we believe in educational equity and providing an excellent education for all of our students in every one of our schools. And myself, along with the educational services team, believe that this new co configuration um, will provide this for our students it will further seal our, um, our mission and our core values. Um, and so we wanted to, I asked the board again to allow us to come back and make that presentation. We did that in April and at the presentation, the, the board um, stated they wanted me to go back and get some more additional information for them regarding cost. Um, they believed, and um, I didn't object because I didn't know the answers at that time, that a five, six, seven, eight configuration, while many agree that it would cost us more money. Um, and at that time, I asked um, our team <coughs> to go back and re-examine how much it would cost if we move into this direction. Um, and the architects did what I asked them to do, and at that time, they included um, a different facility than what we um, originally uh, proposed. And I believe that's kind of what led to some of the, the rumors um, in the community that we were going in a different direction and we were closing other schools, et cetera. But that wasn't the case, but it was me doing my due diligence and saying to the board, you asked for updated um, projections on what it would cost to go in this, this direction and the architects did their due diligence and said, well, you have additional facility on staff you know, uh, that you own, then we believe that you can, should consider that um, facility in the equation. And that is this facility that we're in tonight. So that's how we, a little bit of background of how we got here. So it was a little mix of, is it the right educational program? Yes, we believe it is. Um, and our education team will um, talk about that a little bit um, now. So I hand it over to Felicia and I. Good evening to mm. the superintendent, mm. the board members, and the community members who have joined us here mm. on today. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the great configuration that was recommended uh, from the Ed Services team with the ideals of looking at the strategic plan goals and following under what we consider as one Tiger Nation. Uh, this is a, an opportunity pr to provide for our students uh, an environment in which we can focus in on the ideals and practices of that theme of one Tiger Nation. Here, students, uh, we will be looking at their strengths, uh, developing interests for their future goals, and looking at the students merge into a five-six cohort where this ensures that there is a transition of them in one equal group, letting, allowing them to have equal access uh, to district resources and educational opportunities. Similarly, when we are talking about professional development for teachers in One Tiger Nation, um, teachers teaching at these grade levels 
are provided time and training to deliver an academic program um, that is focused on developing skills, developing interests, and developing relationships. Through the use of our IB framework, teachers will collaboratively design integrated units of study that embed social emotional learning and acquisitions of skills for collaboration, organization, and time management. Since both of our middle schools are on the process to becoming IB world schools, um, that will continue our theme with One Tiger Nation at the 5-6 level. In grades 5 and 6, we see that there is a strong focus on literacy across all content areas. Um, the core areas for grades 5 and 6 build on the experiences and what students have mastered from the pre-K through 4 program. In grades 5 and 6, we focus on making healthy choices, applying students' content knowledge, and reading to learn in all subject areas. Fifth graders are asked to read a lot in a variety of subject areas. They'll learn to analyze characters, plot, and settings, as well as to recognize an author's purpose for writing and um, the organizational strategies used by the author. By reading all the time in their classrooms, in libraries, and at home, students will be able to find what they like to read. Reading for pleasure helps students build their vocabulary and fosters a lifelong love of literature. Approaches to learning in grades five through six include taking initiative and exploring student curiosity. Students will learn and practice strategies that increase persistence, attentiveness, precision to detail, collaboration, and all around help students learn how to learn. In grades five through six, students will have more long-term homework assignments and projects, and will need to develop organizational skills that allow students to keep track of different assignments and deadlines for projects. All of these are key skills for students at the fifth and sixth grade level. Developing study skills, note-taking skills, and organizational skills are very critical at this stage of development, and we need to make sure that our academic program aligns to those goals for students. All the students will continue to practice time management through the use of tracking their activities and their student planners. Um, they also get a chance to develop their interest in careers, music, dance, art, drama, and athletics through in-school and enrichment opportunities, all which would be focus areas <coughs> of a 5-6 program. During the 5-6 configuration, this is where uh, the social-emotional learning begins to take place. <coughs> and for the building leader, uh, they would have to demonstrate a commitment school-wide, articulate a shared vision for students with social-emotional learning and academic development, create opportunities for teachers and support staff to participate in the development of that, assure staff receive training to support and make resources available. For the teaching and support staff, they would participate in a school-wide team or committee that implements and evaluates social-emotional learning, communicate regularly to the public and to the school community within and out of the school, use the social-emotional learning uh, tenets in their teaching of the academic subjects to enhance students' understanding. For parents, it would be a participation in informational meetings, volunteer to assist in the child's classroom, participate with assisting child in the uh, social emotional learning related assignments, and encourage children to participate in community service projects because as uh, Bob has stated, being in the IB world, we would look at the 5-6 configuration in the MYP middle years program for IB. As students move into the seven and eight grade configuration, we see that students will work on the application of literacy across all content areas and integrating core content knowledge and skills into their daily lives. Um, students also transition into adolescence and develop a sense of self and a sense of belonging. Um, the seven eight program builds on the language and literacy development from the pre-K through four grade band and then again on the 5-6 focus on literacy across content areas in 5-6. Uh, in 7-8, the application of literacy across all content is in line with our IB units. Um, in the 7th and 8th grade exploration of college and career readiness, it is focused on the middle years program of IB where students are combining their interests, their academic learning, their physical well-being, and making healthy choices. 
students, again, will be traveling in one single cohort where they have been with their fellow classmates through the high school years. So starting in fifth grade, students will continue to travel in a cohort all the way through their high school graduation. Looking at the social emotional for seventh and eighth grade where we transition into adolescence and a developing a sense of belonging. Journey with me for a second. Consider yourself as walking in the corridors of a middle school and there's a sign that is hanging that says one tiger nation. And the person asks the principal to explain exactly what does that mean. The principal should be sharing that it is a one caring community where respect and responsibility and relationships matter. You continue on this journey and you see signs hanging of student work, posters that define self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, positive relationships, and responsible decision making. And then there are signs that would say what this looks like, what it sounds like, and what it feels like. When you're looking at exploration of the college and career readiness, our research and one of the associations that is used for our high school career and technical education program has identified middle school as a time when students can benefit the most from career exploration, a process of building self-awareness which goes back to our social emotional learning, learning about potential careers, develop a plan for reaching future goals. Career exploration engages middle school students at a time when they are at a high risk of disengaging from learning due to the tech challenges that they have from forming who they are, coping with puberty, and navigating in a new environment. It also capitalizes on their developing abilities to think abstractly and their preferences for teamwork, active learning through relevant life, real life experiences and scenarios. We believe that the five, six, seven, eight grade configuration aligns with the Heights 2020 <coughs> path to student success. As a district, our strategic plan has assisted us in focusing on goals that prepare our students for this pathway to student success. Our focus on strategic goal number one, student outcomes, or in other words, what we want students to know and be able to do, how we're going to know that learning has taken place, and what we do to support learning that is not quite finished yet, all come through with goal number one, student outcomes. Strategic goal number two, educational approach, is there to make sure that we are ensuring that each and every student has access to a quality education, no matter which building that they are located. In strategic goal number three, with our parent and community engaging, engagement, making sure that we are working with parents in our community to come together to provide the additional services and making sure that our efforts are unified and engage in a partnership between the home and school. And goal number four, providing teachers with necessary professional development needed to create and foster learning environments that create these collaborative units around the five, six, and seven, eight concept, as well as social emotional learning, college and career ready, and support for both the student and the teacher. And goal five, which is our financial resources, making sure that we have the resources available to deliver an excellent education for the district for our students. Superintendent Dixon, uh, President Register, members of the board, members of the community. My name is Brad Callender, Director of Current Technical Education. Tonight I'm going to ask for a little bit of latitude because I'm going to attempt to lay out some things uh, about the finances, um, about very complex things. I'm going to try and simplify them. So I have to go back to the beginning, back to basics. So if I bore you, just stay with me for a little bit. I guarantee it'll get better. Well, it might get better. In November 2013, after many years of planning and discussion, the district was able to pass Issue 81. And with Issue 81 and COPS loans, it provided $155 million to the district for Phase 1 of the Master Facilities Plan. And that Phase 1 had certain parts of it that, uh, that we're actually going to discuss tonight. And that was the renovation of Heights High, Monticello Middle, and Roxborough Middle, and also the utilization of Wiley, former middle school, as swing space for the construction period of those other buildings. In May of 2014, the Board of Education was presented with an overall budget of $155 million for Phase 1. 
This sum was broken into three segments, and those segments, again, were the Wiley Enabling Project, the high school, and two middle school renovations. May 2014 figures were prior to the completion of a detailed program of requirements, which you'll hear that term quite a bit as we go through this whole phase. We start with program requirement, we go to schematic design, and then we eventually go to design development and construction documents come out of that. So it's a process. So this was the first phase of that process. And the architect and contract, uh, contractor estimates were based on that. Accordingly, those figures in 2014 were not um, an official construction budget per se, but were mainly a planning estimate that was provided by the owner's representative at that point, uh, I believe it was PMC Regency. Uh, with the numbers that we present this evening, those are all going to be rounded up. You'll notice those are not very precise numbers because we are dealing with very large figures here. Uh, so the, round, the numbers are rounded in the 2014 estimates. You'll see three columns up, uh, three rows up there, hard costs, soft costs, and total costs. Total cost <coughs> is easy to understand. In construction, we can essentially break it down to two pieces, hard cost, which is the direct construction ex expenses, as, as Mr. Silverman is fond of saying, the bricks and the sticks, the things you used to actually build it, and the soft cost was anything that's not a direct construction cost, and that includes like architectural and engineering things, uh, consultants, permits, insurance, those kind of things. Don't actually go into the physical construction of the facility itself. We're going to focus on hard costs tonight because essentially the soft costs really haven't changed that much and the hard costs are the big portion of this budget. Beginning with the Wiley Enabling Project. As noted in the May 2014 planning estimate of the Enabling Project, it was about $15.7 million. The additional costs right now have brought it to $21 million, essentially. And the hard cost, 16.7. Now, that's above the 14.5 and, and above the, uh, the total cost we were expecting. And some of that includes things that are necessary to have a project proceed forward. And that is to get the space ready, to get things moved, to make sure that we have places for other equipment to go and to get things started. A few things contributed to uh, those escalations in costs, and they were a delay in project commencement, mitigating some unforeseen issues, upgrades and additional scope that the district requested as well. The start of construction for the Wiley Enabling Project <coughs> was delayed from May through December of 2014 due to issues with the permits that were issued by the City of University Heights. Um, the owner's representative estimates this added about $700,000 in cost due to the changes necessary to the product, project delivery system and the accompanying acceleration and the move costs that were forced by the delay. As this neighborhood project proceeded, approximately $1.6 million in additional costs for MEP. MEP is mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. It's the stuff in the walls. It's the stuff that gives us heat and lights, those kinds of things. Um, and these were necessary to change orders because of some of the, the cost accompanying having to get a building back out of storage, essentially, and get it operational again. District also expanded the scope of this project. You can see some of that up there on the board to maintain the integrity of the educational environment with the addition of a full music wing. Many of you don't realize there's a whole new wing built on the front of this building that's a very good musical space a second gymnasium, and enclosed walkway. And that was approximately $1.7 million. In addition to the things that the district requested and to the permitting issues and the delays, there were some other unforeseen issues. These are things you really don't expect to come up. And these were things like additional waterproofing, some additional abatement, we weren't sure we were going to have to do, an upgrade to the generator, safety and security uh, enhancements, and some other field conditions that totaled approximately $1.3 million. And all that added up, and that brought us to the cost overrun there. To the high school now. The high school is going to be a crown jewel in this district. It is, it is phenomenal, it is beautiful. Um, if you're driven by on Cedar, you can see the grass is already even beginning to grow, and that's an exciting thing. The high school's May 2014 hard budget was about $82 million. 
And the contractor's estimate at the schematic design phase in September 2014 was consistent with this figure as you look back at the documents. Now, all those figures saw considerable variation. There were some things that came, went into the project and came out of the project during design development. It was still tracking to a similar amount in April 2015 at the conclusion of the design development phase. And at this point, the architect began to work on construction drawings and the demolition and site work packages were let in June of 2015 to keep us on schedule. We had to maintain a schedule if we were going to get everything done and be able to open in August of 2017. In July of 2015, the CMR, that is the construction manager at risk, that is the person responsible for building the building, the construction manager, performed a re-estimate based on a 50% completion of construction drawings, the last set of drawings. At this point, the CMR indicated that there were significant anticipated, unanticipated <coughs> cost increases due to a very competitive local construction market that had not been factored into design development. If you remember, there was something else going on that summer, that year and that time prior, that uh, impacted construction. Uh, additionally, uh, some of these examples were uh, due in part to uh, subcontractors having work and, and not needing to bid low. These are things like uh, labor for steel fabrication, uh, for plumbing, for electrical, um, for drilling in the geo fields. And the labor market was equally matched by an increase to a certain extent for some materials as they went up because, again, it was um, an environment where a lot of construction was going on. And with this construction, when there's a supply and demand basic economic states, that price will go up when demand goes up. In addition, the number of scope changes discussed in the design development phase were not included in those construction drawings. And combined, these issues increased our hard cost to approximately $88 million. That's a big jump at that point. In late July of 2015, the board, recognizing that there were some issues with costs, authorized some additional value engineering. Value engineering is where you go back through, you look at what you've done, and you say, can we scope this back at all? Can we still meet our requirements, but maybe cut back on some of the square footage? And this was an attempt to decrease overall cost, and we did do that. However, with the, uh, with the value engineering and the change orders that required afterwards, essentially it was a net gain of nothing. Um, we didn't really gain anything. We stayed actually pat at the $88 uh, million. High school project also experienced some significant costs associated with latent issues. Again, unforeseen things, including soil conditions. Some of you may remember, we've discussed at length, <coughs> quote, bad soil, unsuitable soils. You saw perhaps a giant mountain of dirt sitting where the uh, baseball and the softball fields were. This was not that the dirt itself was bad, but that it was not structurally sound to build upon because of some of the organic materials that were in it from earlier construction projects. So that had to be pulled out to the cost of approximately uh, $850,000. Uh, additional conditions were some of the issues with structural steel. When you're dealing with an older building, you're going to have issues behind some of the walls that you find when you open up the walls. About $700,000 of that uh, was required for additional abatement that we weren't aware of. They would find things as they began to work through the process itself. And this was above what had been in the initial GMP or the Guaranteed Maximum Price contract of over half a million dollars already. The project also experienced significant financial impact due to other subsurface and building age related conditions, including unanticipated foundations. When you look at a construction project, you look at things like uh, the as-built drawings. And I can <coughs> tell you right now from experience that they did not keep as accurate a record in 1926 as they did now. So we would find things that it might say this foundation wall is only this wide and dig down and it was twice as wide or it wasn't where it was supposed to be. So that added additional cost as well. And there's always risk when you do a renovation. But again, the community decided that was an important part of what they wanted to do moving forward. So that's part of the cost and the risk you assume. Now, the high school is scheduled to open on time. That is great news. We'll have a certificate of occupancy the 1st of August. Yes. That's fantastic. I mean, that's, that's a great thing. And we'll be ready for school to start a few weeks after that. 
However, there are a few change orders we're still working through, and some of those things will be worked through as we get closer to that time. It's not going to add in significant cost, but we're still not able to fully predict the absolute final number because, again, we still have some unresolved issues. However, estimates put that number for hard costs approximately $90 million, maybe a little bit below that. Uh, this is $8 million over the initial estimate from 2014. Again, a big jump. Hard cost issues. To the middle schools. Very quickly, as you look up on that chart, the May 2014 document had a planning estimate of $46 million for the two middle school renovations. That was the total amount available, $40 million of which was available for hard costs, $40 million. As previously noticed, the actual anticipated cost of the Wiley Enabling Project and of the high school are about 20% more than they expected. But again, you figure in the factor of the contingencies, that percentage is a touch lower. Um, but this means that about $30 million remains at hard cost that can be spent on the middle schools. It's 25% less. It's a quarter less than we had in May. And that's a significant chunk. This has required a reevaluation uh, of the scope of the middle school <coughs> segment of phase one. And to speak to that tonight, joined by Pat O'Brien, who is PMC, works for PMC as our owner's representative, Mr. O'Brien. Thanks, Fred. Uh, Dr. Dixon, President of Register, Board of Education, guests. I'm Pat O'Brien with PMC Regency, and I'm going to talk about the design process for our two middle school renovation projects, where we're at, what some options might be, and uh, where uh, we might be uh, able to go. So when we hired Moody Nolan in the late fall of 2015, we asked them to uh, look at our master plan, our student enrollment, educational programs, and our two historic buildings, and synthesize a design for us. And you see the two pictures we have up there. Uh, those are really nice looking options of buildings that uh, Moody Nolan came up with early in the schematic design process. Unfortunately, when we asked uh, the folks at Turner Construction, our construction manager at risk to put cost to it, those really nice looking buildings, either as a six, seven, eight building like we have now, or even if we considered at some point in the future we had a different grade configuration, we have costs that would well exceed the amount of money we have left. And that was in April of 2016. We said, you know, we might have some issues here. Again, particularly the, when you look at 26 and a half or $20.6 million for two buildings, that, that's much when we have $30 million total. So we had to go back to the drawing board and ask our folks in the design team to say, we need you to work within what our budget is. And our budget is $30 million. Hey, Pat. Can, sure. you, can you go back to the back to the last slide for a second? Sure. Aren't those numbers switched? Because to do the three grade levels, it's more money than the two grade levels. Am I nuts? No, no I think that's correct. Those are correct. The, there's additional student population when you put the five six in. It's a bigger number than the number of six seven eight students, and it, in both cases, uh, you would have a greater student population. You would need a um, uh, you, you need more space and you do more okay. work in terms of making the building 100% okay. suitable for Got it. <coughs> that if, if, I, if I may, since, <coughs> since Jim broke the silence, uh, the, uh, I would point out that when you go back to the slide for the new, all new construction concepts, if you go back to the next, that the, those were a, a design exercise that Moody Nolan did to see comparing renovation versus all new. At that time, the cost per square foot for the middle schools was 225 a square foot. The initial cost, these came in at 250 a square foot, so these were non-viable before. So I, I just want a clarification that this was a design exercise when we were exploring would all new be more cost effective than renovating, but the issue with the all new was at 250 a square versus 225 initial, it wasn't viable at that juncture. Yeah, regardless of the, the dollar per square foot, and our, our dollar right. per square foot at the high school was even higher than that. Oh, right. Here. I know, but what I'm saying is that 
this exercise came back that it wasn't affordable. I just want clarification that this wasn't, unfortunately, this wasn't viable when it came, when it got priced out, it wasn't viable. Correct. Yeah. <coughs> All right, so we, we have $30 million, and um, so we have to scale back the scope and the scale of what the renovations are going to be at Monticello and Roxboro. And when we're moving forward in 2016, we are still using a 678 configuration, which is, as Dr. Dixon mentioned, that the topic had come up. Should we consider in 2016 other options? And we said we're going to stay with 678. So we ask Moody Nolan to stay on that path, and we say, you know, we want to still open these buildings in August of 2019. So when we look at what does it mean to have a, a more modest renovation rather than a full-blown renovation that was contemplated in the original master plan, here, here's what the elements are that we are currently designing in, in those renovations. Every classroom, all the corridors, the cafeteria get new flooring, new paint, new ceilings. We go to the administrative areas and we put new, paint, uh, new finishes, new paint, new carpet there as well. I want to change out the reception desk area because the way you get into both of them at either building is it's not as smooth as we'd like. So there's a minor renovation there. And then some, some changes, enhancements to what the building looks like when you first come in the entrance. And I have some, I have some pictures of what that would look like. The, there's a picture there in the, in the center of what the entrance to Monticello looks like now. And you can see when we talk about making it a modest renovation, it's still the same entry, try to lighten it up. Uh, and, then, and these are some ideas from the folks at Moody Nolan on how do we, how do we based on our limited budget, how do we make that more amenable, uh, make it a nicer looking entrance. That's Monticello. We have, I mentioned we wanted to take the administrative areas. And you see on the upper left corner a picture of what we have now. And the idea is let's create a more open space in there. Uh, for the students, for people coming into administration. This is the picture in the lower right corner. And then we have the cafeteria. Uh, again, a, a, a modest renovation says we're going to change out uh, what it's going to look like, try to brighten the space. Um, but effectively, we're not moving walls. Um, and, and that's some ideas on what it might look like. Roxboro, picture of in the, the bottom middle of what it looks like now. Try to do the same thing, brighten it up, change out the flooring. Uh, or improve the flooring that's in there, increase the lighting, uh, provide a little bit of a, uh, a signature with respect to the Roxboro School. That's our entrance. We want to do something similar with administrative spaces. Again, create a more open space so that's more welcoming to students coming in through those areas. And then we have a picture of the cafeteria, which if you've been in that cafeteria, that picture in the upper left doesn't necessarily do it justice. But the, the, uh, the, the illustration on the right, trying to open up that space, make the ceiling feel higher, give it a little bit more volume, uh, make it a little bit lighter. So that, that's some uh, pictures from Moody Nolan on what those spaces would look like, some of the bigger public spaces. So to continue with respect to the work that will happen that's currently included in the Monticello renovations, at Monticello, we would take the, where the girls' locker room is now and make that two locker rooms. Uh, that would be certainly an improvement in terms of the way we understand that uh, PE is conducted. We would take the counseling area that um, uh, over by the, where the media center is, revise it and, and have the counseling spaces um, clustered in that area. And then the elevator cab finishes, not replacing the elevators, but trying to upgrade those finishes in the cabs. So that would be the big picture at uh, Monticello at Roxboro. The sixth grade in the basement, uh, we have that uh, space we renovated uh, four or five years ago. There's no restrooms down there. That was a, a big concern from um, folks, obviously, that use the building. So we would be adding restrooms on the lower level. In both buildings, on the heating and cooling and plumbing side, air, new heating system, <coughs> new, HVAC, new, eight, new air conditioning throughout the entire building. In the group restrooms, we'd put in all new fixtures and we'd put in new drinking fountains. So that's on the plumbing side. On technology and electrical, each of the classrooms, in addition to getting the paint, the carpet, the new ceilings, get uh, a new short pro projector, like the ones we're putting in at the high school, a new wireless access point, uh, new lights, uh, new fire alarm devices, a paging system to uh, talk to the office, and uh, new electrical outlets for plugs. Uh, we would update the electrical panel, electrical distribution system, and then where we have existing security cameras, put new, better cameras in that place. 
this is an example of what one of those classrooms would look like with new ceiling, new light, new projector, uh, new carpet. There's new furniture in there. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that here in a minute. But that's, that's a rendering of, of what Moody Nolan thinks that classroom <coughs> would look like. So that's what's happening inside the spaces. Now here's what's not happening. When we say modest, uh, there are things that we would not be addressing. We would not put in new windows, and we would not be able to address uh, any of the problems with the exterior walls. Uh, we would leave the unit vents and the radiant heaters that are there in place. We looked at removing them to try to create more space in a classroom, but it was about a half a million dollars. Um, so the unit vents and radiant heaters that are there stay. The elevators, as I mentioned, at Monticello we would upgrade the, uh, the finish in the cab, but we don't have the funding to replace the elevators. We would not be able to change the food service equipment. And in the classrooms themselves, even though we put in new paint, carpet, ceilings, we wouldn't change any of the cabinetry or the shelving in the classrooms. Other things that uh, we would not be able to do, not touching the, the finishes, the, the furniture, excuse me, the, the flooring or the painting in the media center, also known as a library. Uh, there is no furniture included in the $30 million <coughs> budget, not touching the lockers in the corridor. <coughs> doing some of the roofs, but limited replacement of the shingle roofs, uh, leaving uh, some of the roofs uh, untouched. On the HVAC and plumbing side, work that is not currently included in our $30 million modest renovation. We have a new fire alarm system, which is really critical to the safety of the children. Uh, a fire sprinkler system is to ensure that your building doesn't have damage if there's a fire, but we would not be putting in sprinklers. We would not be replacing the plumbing lines, replace plumbing fixtures, but not the plumbing lines that are relatively old. Um, so that would not be touched. Okay, on the technology and electrical side, even though we're putting in a series of new devices in the classrooms, we would not be putting new network equipment in the MDF and the IDF. The, the, the basically the, the brains of the computer networks would stay. Uh, we would not be uh, upgrading those. We would not be changing the exterior lighting or the parking lot lighting. And in the classrooms, uh, new classrooms uh, typically would have a sound reinforcement system to assist the, the teacher. We would not be doing that. And then out on the sites themselves, uh, there would be only uh, minimal required work. We would not be repaving the parking lots, upgrading the landscaping, the sidewalks, uh, so minimal site work. So that's, uh, now that's, we're, we're probably about two thirds of the way through the design process called design development. We're finished up with design development and our costs, uh, based on those parameters, are at 30 million, which from that perspective, uh, between the design team and the construction management team, we're on target with that um, in terms of our modest renovations. So that's $30 million. We have, uh, as I mentioned, in the modest portion, there were quite a few things I noted that were not gonna be replaced. To continue to operate and use these buildings, we will need to replace things like the elevators and the walking coolers and freezers. And that is something that um, George Petkak, as Director of Business Services, is managing as part of his five-year permanent improvement plan. So he would have to uh, allocate money for the items listed there. The elevators sort of work. They work right now. There's, a, I think, a, a minor repair we have to do right now. But the, again, kitchen equipment is an issue over the long term. Uh, the servers, the UPSs, and the switches in the network equipment room would need replaced. Again, we are only doing part of the roofing. The balance of the roofing uh, will not last more than 10 more years. We'll have to allocate some money out of PI for that. The facade at Monticello uh, <coughs> is experiencing some distress with respect to its ability to keep water on the outside and keeping it from migrating to the inside. That would be a significant cost that we would not be able to let go for a long period of time. It would have to be taken care of in the next five years. And then at Roxboro, uh, when we had the, uh, the improvements when we started this project and we temporarily increased the, uh, the enrollment over there, it, if you may recall, we took two of the, park, the tennis courts away and made it a parking lot. That's temporary. We are supposed to be restoring those. We should be doing some other improvements because even as is, we still don't have very good circulation at the Roxboro Middle School site. So those are things that we would have to address uh, in the current modest plan out of uh, Georgia's uh, PI budget. Okay, so one of the things that we wanted to talk about uh, with respect to the board is, is making sure 
uh, we are aware of what our path is and determining do we want to stay on that path of renovating those middle schools the way I've just described or do we want to look at some alternative paths and, and their alternative paths is are not something that has been decided um, but we wanted to know if we want to still open the buildings in August of 2019 if we stay on the current path we can do that if we look at alternative paths uh, there are a lot more inputs that have to go into it but there are some things that uh, we have asked our design team to investigate in terms of alternative paths and we'd like to know you know at the uh, in, in the July board meeting if we should stay on the current path or if, or if we want to look at and explore in more detail the viability of some al uh, alternative options. And there are some things that we did ask uh, the folks at, at Moody Nolan to consider on our behalf, and that is if we want to change the grade configuration and we want to go to one building with five, six, and one building with seven, eight, we asked Moody Nolan, look at the assets that we have, and we have three buildings, and, and give us a determination of what you think as an architect, looking at facilities and looking at program of educational function, spaces and students, what would you recommend in, without taking other consideration, but looking at it strictly from an architectural perspective. And the feedback we got from the folks at Moody Nolan was a plan, one of the alternative paths, but just as an idea. They said, well, if you're already using Wiley as a 7-8, it seems to work fairly well. It worked well as a high school, from what they could tell. And it seems like it would work well as a 7-8 building. So that was one of the things that Moody Nolan has suggested as an option, just as an option, an alternative path. They also, and they <coughs> mapped out, they mapped out the, what it would look like. They also said you could use either Monticello as a 5-6 building or Roxborough as a 5-6 building. And they tried to map out the, the program. The color scheme shows, and it's hard to tell from, from uh, where you're sitting, or even if you have a, a bigger picture plan, but they mapped out educationally, how would that building work? If Wyler was a 7-8 building, Roxborough could be a 5-6 building, Roxborough could be a 7-8 building. E each of those buildings could work in those configurations, managing each of the grades. So that would be things to consider uh, as options for alternatives. It, now, in those scenarios, in any of those situations, those would all entail doing a major renovation at one of the buildings. If you didn't want to have to allocate significant amounts of your PI money, your permanent improvement money. And you said, let's go back to the concept of a major renovation that addresses all of the issues in either Roxborough or Monticello. We asked Turner to give us an idea of approximately what do you think that cost would be. They said, you're, you're in the 25 to $27 million, the 25 to $27 million range to do a major renovation at one of the buildings. So if you think about it, if we have $30 million, that doesn't leave a lot of money left to do uh, whatever, whichever other building you're going to allocate, but that would be three to five million dollars, 25 to 27 for a major renovation, which would correct everything that we weren't doing in a modest renovation. All of those items would be addressed. So we could do one major renovation, one minor renovation. In the minor renovation, we would obviously want to prioritize things like accessibility, uh, code issues, uh, HVAC issues, which impact the educational environment. So that, that is a uh, potential alternative path if we do not continue with the two modest renovations that we're currently contemplating. If we were gonna go on a different path, if we were not going to do two modest renovations as six, seven, and eight buildings, it would mean that we would not be opening buildings in August of 19. We would be opening uh, buildings in August of 2020, which would also mean we'd have an extra year of students in the Wiley swing space. There is certainly an impact and things that would have to be considered on the second phase of the master plan for the district. Obviously educational programming, permanent improvement funds, and without question we would have uh, to get some community input on alternatives, on options, and on what would happen in phase two. So our next step uh, that we'd like to, to consider is do we stay on our current path do we explore alternative paths and again obviously the, the current path we could stay on that path if the board would confirm that on July 11th still look at, at some community feedback but we would still be on a path to be able to renovate the two buildings open them in August of 2019 if instead we want to look at other options other alternatives 
in terms of facilities, in terms of educational opportunities. Uh, they would be a more deliberate process in terms of community engagement, in terms of evaluating architectural options, educational options, and, uh, and that, would, uh, that would, would commence, again, based on uh, board input <coughs> over the summer. Dr. Dixon? Thank you, Pat. So, board, that ends our presentation, and we open it up for any questions. I think, well, I'll give it back to you, President Register. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to provide for okay. that. Ends. Thank you, team. Any uh, reaction? Thoughts? I have a few yeah. questions. Um, I'll start. A lot of these are going to be real basic, rapid fire to get clarity, I think. Um, <coughs> Pat, you didn't discuss it in any, any detail. Um, it was referenced in if we go with any, any delay adds another year to the project. I believe any year of delay costs us approximately $2 million in escalation and other costs, correct? That, that's correct. We have two issues if we do not open, if we do not start construction in uh, 2018 we lose about 5% per year in inflation on construction costs. And then we would also have to extend the leases for the modulars that remain. Correct. So in effect, if we delay a year, it costs us $2 million out of our $30 million <coughs> bricks and sticks. That's correct. So in effect, a delay would mean our, our budget is actually $28 million versus 30 for yes. the scenario. Okay. Um, my next question would be, um, I, if we were to examine and consider an upper and lower model, um, the question I would pose is, according to a Regency PMC report August of 2016, to do that, we would have to add square footage to either, to actually both buildings, Monticello and Roxborough, if we wanted to use them for an upper and lower model. So the question I would pose is, how do, is the scenario, if you went, if you went heavy on either building, and I believe there's an interest in going heavy probably more on Monticello than Roxborough, the question I would pose is, does this include adding square footage to Monticello to accommodate as an upper and lower concept? And if not, then how is it that suddenly we can, we're able to squeeze kids into the building now that you weren't able to do six months ago? One of the things that we would have to look at if we were going to do a five, six, and seven, eight, obviously when you add the fifth graders right. population, that's adding students. Right. And, and uh, we would have to confirm that our educational program could fit. Monticello is a larger building right. and has more uh, not as well utilized spaces. And if you were going to do a major renovation and move walls around and make some of those not so good spaces more efficient, there's the potential that it would fit. Now we haven't, you know, we, we think that that's, that's likely we need Moody Nolan to confirm that for us. That's part of the reason you see such a big difference between a modest renovation <coughs> cost and a major renovation cost. It's, it's not just the added cost for things that we're not doing, but it's also presuming that you have to create some spaces where you don't have good spaces now. The, I guess my question relating to that would be, have we gained, then, then what you're saying then is we haven't gamed out how we would schedule the building because you don't know the physical plan. I guess the, the, question, I'm, the, problem, the question I'm having is it's a chicken and egg. How are we supposed to make a determination if we want to go with an upper and lower model if we don't know if it'll work in the space? And my concern would be that we were to commit to an upper and lower model and then we come back and say, oh, you know what? It won't work with our budget. I guess when, when would we have, if we wanted to pursue it, when would we have the data that games out our current enrollment and our current programming in those spaces? Because the reason, the reason I'm posing this question is, the building's peak enrollments is what you're looking to put into it, which was in the late 70s when you had higher teacher people, people ratio, less specialized spaces, <coughs> and your special needs program was vastly different. So I'm trying to grasp how you're going to put just under 800 kids in a building that is, would be almost the same as it was 40 years ago when we had 775 kids in a building. The, well, a couple of things going on there, Eric. First of all, our, the way we do education today is a lot different than it was in the 70s right. and 80s in terms of classes. So if you could have put 700 kids in a building then, they won't fit now. Right. Um, but one of the challenges with the major renovation, and again, part of the, the reason you saw um, 
numbers that are between $25 and $27 million, is, is it does contemplate moving walls and the potential that we would, might have to do a small addition. Right. Um, small, but again, we, have to, we haven't fully investigated the complete and total ramifications of uh, what that would be. However, uh, I think we have some confidence that between Moody Nolan and Turner, they're telling us, you know, if you say you want to pick one building and you want to identify that as a building that you would have as either A56 or A78, that, that the dollars that we have would be significant, to, would be able to accomplish that task. Well, okay, let me, let me go a little bit further down line then. So if you go to an upper and lower, or you go all in on one building, the question I would pose is, well, when are you going to renovate the other building? Because that's what we told the voters we were going to do. So the question I'm posing is, when do you renovate the other building, and where's that money coming from? <coughs> and also I have another question in regard to this decision tree. It says that we would forfeit future state reimbursement funds, and I don't understand why we would be forfeiting those funds either. The fifth grade is not funded in the, uh, the current plan. So if you renovate a building now, um, you have to go back to the state and, and basically go back and look at your project agreement and your master plan and make sure that lines up with what they're doing, with what they see in terms of your enrollment and the allocation towards your facilities. Um, so that it, it becomes a very tricky formula with the state. So we, well, does that mean we forfeit? The question, it says forfeit. We're, for, we're, not for, we're, we're not forfeiting the dollars we get for the high school. <coughs> the high school is the high school. That's, 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 you know. the for, we wouldn't be forfeiting our 14% match for the spaces the state deems worthy for the 678 square footage. We would be losing the dollars for the fifth grade square footage, correct? Or the dollars for that building. It's, it's whatever the percentage of those that, that grade level is that comes in. So let's assume we have a thousand students, right. hypothetically, two hundred and fifty, one quarter of that. We would forfeit one quarter of that allocation. So it wouldn't be if I have a five six building that half of the square theoretically in the eyes of the state, half of the square <coughs> footage for the fifth graders would be would be deemed unfundable. Based on their formula, that that that's I mean that's a real rough way of putting it. Right. Yes. But um, there's a very it's a very complex formula. Oh, oh yeah. I, I, well, I just I mean the reality is is that best case scenario someday in the future we'll get fourteen percent from the state. But the issue ends up being is that if we had the fifth grade theoretically then we would only be getting seven percent for those kids for that half half of the square for that, footage. For that for that okay. particular square footage. Then my question ends up this still goes back to my other question which would be <coughs> if we go forget high and forget upper and lower because I, I think it's a whole other conversation. If we go to all in on one building and little and, and book us on the other building, well, one, that's, how, I guess the question is being, you're putting three million into one other, in the other building. When are we going to have the dollars to renovate the other building? <coughs> uh, that's, that's phase two. But it was in phase, but here's, here, the, I, I understand. Well, that's why it's an option there. Well, no, no, I, well, no I understand as, as the professionals, oh, for those of us here, particularly those who worked on the bond issue, um, we told the public we're renovating two buildings. <coughs> and going Cadillac on one building, and you got some paint and a, a lift in the other building, isn't going to play. So the, the problem is I can't go to the public and say, hey, we, we, can, we I got two kids, we can only send one to college. Um, so, you know, I got playing King Solomon here. You can't, we can't, I, I can't go to the public and say, oh, well, we'll figure it out sometime, sometime in the future, because that's, we can't, we can't do that, at least for me. And then if I go into the educational model, the question I would pose is, if we're doing a 5-6, if I'll refer to myself as the Oppenheimer of the 5-6 model, the upper lower, because we explored this as at the late facilities committee, the question I would pose is, when I look at Lakewood, Euclid, Parma, and then other MSAN systems who are very comparable, none of them are using this model. So the question I would pose is, why are we proposing to use this model when the only systems I know who are doing it who are similar to us, it seems to be they had a, a, a student population issue they were trying to address. As a, they came up with an educational model to address buildings. The question I would pose is, why why aren't any of these other systems doing it, and we want to do it? Well, Eric, we can't answer that question why other systems choose to choose their own grade span. They choose, they have their community input, and they, in their instructional team, they choose their instructional design. Just like we're making that 
choice for our district. Why not? So I, I don't think that we should copy what someone else is doing. I think we should do, we look at our data and our program and we choose what's best for our students. Well, I, I guess my, my issue is I go back to, uh, I don't know who the, I, I think it's Steve Jobs, but somebody said great artists copy. The question I would pose is, is that, I, I'm sort of, why hasn't anybody <coughs> called, if we, I know we've got folks going to the MSAN conferences all the time. I'm surprised that nobody called up any of these MSAN districts and, and said, hey, you guys are doing, we're, what do you, why do you guys use this configuration? We're considering it Eric, we, different. Eric, well, I think you're making assumptions. I'm on the MSAN governing board. Okay, right, okay right. so I speak to those superintendents on a monthly basis. I was just with them in Chicago two months ago. So I know what those districts are doing. And again, communities decide on the best configuration based on their student population and the programming that they want. And this is something that this community has wanted and asked for, and we have investigated, and we're bringing it as an option. If we choose not to explore this further, then that's a choice this community makes. But I don't think that we should mimic any other community and jump on anyone's bandwagon. We should choose the best educational programming for our students in our community. But I guess, my, my, I, I'm not saying jump on the bandwagon, what I'm saying is, isn't there value in looking at the peer systems to see why they're going with something versus and another? We and we can have. we learn from that? We have. And then I guess well, then it goes to then it goes to <coughs> what was if if we've done that, then what was the response we received from those systems in regard to why they use this one 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 methodology versus another? I will provide that for you I, if I you would, need that. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I thought we'd ask that for that. that that's here and there. Thank the, you. My, the next, my I guess. Uh, my other question would be, if we're, if we say we're going to go to an upper lower, and we're going to figure out in the future, at some time in the future, we're going to figure out how we fund. We're going to have one building that's going to be really nice, and the other one is just continuing to move along. Then the question I would pose is, if we're pulling 400 students out of the elementary cohort, how does that not accelerate the necessity to close? elementary buildings because I'm sorry, because by my math I know we can talk about adding preschool two of the buildings the two footprint buildings cannot accommodate <coughs> the accreditation for preschool and we shouldn't assume that that would be students but by my math we're still at only 375 kids per elementary building so I want to clarify we are not proposing that we do one one renovation major or minor is an option right right so I don't want people okay, to think okay. that's what Right, right, we're doing. So it is an option that we can explore or right. we can go back and explore what would it cost to do both. I mean, so there are many options we can explore. We know that we're going to, we look <coughs> at our elementary schools, regardless of five, six, seven, eight, right. there are two elementary schools that are scheduled in the master facilities right. planned to close based on enrollment. The decision was made in 2013. Right. So if we move in this direction, <coughs> would that impact our elementary schools more than the two that are already slated to close? Possibly, but we're going to move um, pre-Ks in those buildings as well. So we don't know what those numbers uh, would be. We have an estimate of what those numbers are going to be, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to close an additional well, no, elementary no, school. No, I wasn't saying an additional elementary school. What I was saying was is that doesn't that have increased the possibility that we would accelerate the potential need to close an elementary because if our enrollment is declining as we keep seeing on our charts and my, my point is if we're pulling 400 students from the elementary cohort and putting them in the middle school that would inc that would continue to be the accelerate the decline of the enrollment even if we have some counterbalance by preschool <coughs> enrollment i guess my, my point is doesn't this doesn't this have the potential to increase the likelihood that we would have to close an elementary building sooner than later the timing, I don't know. We have to investigate that. Well, I, well and then I guess. Because I don't think there's a timing on the current closure of the elementary. Well, no, it there was some estimates, so I think there would be some additional estimates that we would have to, estimated time frames we would have to look at. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll yield the floor to somebody else because I. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Well, this, <coughs> this is a great exercise, and it's great for the community to hear the options that are being thrown around uh, get a little bit better clarity um, on what we talk about in our board meetings when it comes to the cost for the high school and Wiley and certainly clarify on you know the scenarios that you're looking at and, and in that regard you know I think 
all good business decisions, you really need to look at scenarios. Um, unfortunately, it, it's created a sense of panic um, to many community members. Um, and I think it's turned into a little bit of a distraction. Um, but it's a fruitful uh, <coughs> exercise. I mean, here we are. We have to make some multi-million dollar decisions. If we just sort of run down a path without doing sort of a check and balance, that's, in my opinion, fiscally irresponsible. Um, what we're doing right now, I think, is fiscally responsible. Um, yeah, I have concerns, you know, delaying the middle schools by a year. Um, and it basically is $2 million less. Um, I sort of look at the decision tree and I take exception to things like what Eric has mentioned regarding the forfeiture of future state funds. I mean, you know, I've worked with the design team. You can amend your plan. Um, if we're going to be amending phase two, we'd be amending the plan. So I think saying it's a forfeiture when it really is only potentially forfeiting, forfeiting fifth grade money, I think that's overreaching. I mean, the fact that the decision tree, um, you know, maybe this is a worst case scenario, but calls for modular units um, in one of the uh, middle schools in order to make a upper and lower work. I know it needs to get figured out, and again, maybe that's a worst case scenario, but in my eyes, that's a temporary solution. Who knows if the city will even buy into it. Um, I mean, we can't, you know, my opinion, you know, having our kids in, in the trailers like they were at Wiley, why it <coughs> worked great on a temporary basis, I'm not sure that's a permanent solution. And there's going to be money necessary to fix that. Um, I love the fact that uh, when uh, the architects and the design team embarked on the middle schools, the plan was to make those buildings somewhat flexible so we can accommodate um, additional um, additional grades. Um, you know, if, you know. If and that's I'm, true, I want to clarify. He's, what Jim is alluding to is when we <coughs> first asked, and I think um, um, Pat stated, we first asked Moody Nolan to design our buildings. We did ask for flexible space. So if we wanted to entertain five, six later. So this, we have talked about five, six, seven, eight since I've been here in 2014. So that configuration is something that we're all aware of and we've all said that we hope to have at some point. So you're right. So we did state that if we couldn't do it right away, could we design the space in a flexible manner that in the future, we, as enrollment continued to decline, because we updated our enrollment trends, we wanted to be able to um, make sure that space was flexible. So you're correct. And I think what we learned as we got to our budget realities that with the $30 million um, our hard cost budget, there really was no flexibility even in, in that reality, in that regard. So, um, moving forward, we stay on our current pathway. There is no, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's money or for a flexible design, um, even with what we um, showed earlier. The, big, the biggest challenge is in a, a middle school, seven and eight, yeah. has a greater component of athletic um, yeah. athletics that needs to have a, more support than you would in five, six, because you don't have the um, inter-school competitions. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the biggest difference. I mean, right. other, otherwise you're, and you do have differences in, in science classrooms and, and some of those things, exactly how they function. Um, but to have a building that ultimately could be a six, seven, eight, or a five, six, or a seven, eight, is, um, it's a challenge. And, and the folks at Moody Nolan are, are, you know, are, are indicating that there are things they can hedge that give us flexibility, yeah, but yeah. at the end of the day, with $30 million, you, you, you know, you um, cut off a lot of those opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so we, we've always had this phase two plan looming out there. Yeah. And one of the things that made phase one work, um, I mean, to get it passed by the voters, was a very comprehensive public engagement process that included us, city officials, PTAs, reaching heights, Maybe I'm repeating myself, you know, city officials again. But, I mean, we had a very, very large committee come together 
And I mean, one of the recommendations at that time, and I know that was years ago, was to stick with the um, uh, six, seven, eight buildings. Um, and that was a difficult process. I mean, I, you know, I've sat in those meetings. <coughs> I'd say 50% of the people wanted it, 50% of the people didn't. I mean, I, I get why you as an educator have made the recommendation. I mean, I see some cost efficiencies. I mean, I've asked for some, you know, what those cost efficiencies are, like on a regular basis. I mean, I mean, are the, is it more efficient to keep the five, six in one building as opposed to spreading them out? I'd love to see that information. But I'm also at, at the point where um, I almost think we need to reopen phase two. And really, if we want to do the, um, we as a community, not necessarily as people sitting, working for the school district like we are. Um, and I almost think we need to have this community engagement process to flush that out. Um, I also think things have changed. Um, you want to put preschools in the buildings, that's great. We also have an asset like this building that can be reused for something else. What is that? <coughs> um, even if we went down one of these other paths and let's say closed Roxboro or closed Monticello, um, I'd feel really uncomfortable walking down that path in just a few short weeks without really having a better understanding of what's going to happen with that property. And I think there's a lot of community members that sort of feel the same way. Um, and to answer that also, um, and we listened when you um, stated that concern before, Jim, and if you look at the decision uh, tree, if on July 11th, the board says at that date, okay, we have decided that we're going to stay on a current path. We're going to, um, we look at the master facilities plan, we're going to stay the course as outlined. That decision can be made on July 11th. Or the board says, you know, we want to explore a, an alternative plan. And then that is when a community <coughs> conversation, as you described, we open, we start that process. Um, and then that process um, starts, and we will have to have a decision made by December 5th. Um, but we wanted to make sure we included that, as we discussed, that process and with the community um, would look like some alternatives, some options, et cetera. Uh, but again, that's only if the board decides that you know, on July 11th, you know what, Talisa, we're going we're to stay the course. We believe this is the best pathway with the, the resources that we have. Um, we can ask the architects to look again and say, you know what, if, if we make this space flexible and move in this direction later on, how much would that cost us? And then we would have those numbers, and we can bring those numbers back to the board and say, you know, it's going to cost us additional X amount of dollars in order to make those spaces flexible if we go down this path later. That's something that we can do and present um, prior to the um, July 11th day. Yeah, but the reality is if we decide to um, go this alternate path and sort of open up open everything up for you know reevaluation. Correct. Um, we know we need more money. Correct. That's, that's to true. really, really do it. And we know and it's going it to delay right. the process. Correct. And You're absolutely we right. don't have state money. We know that that's right. not an option. Right. That means we're going to have to put a levy on the ballot. Um, I mean, we don't have enough money on in the the the, the PI budget to to do this. It just seems like it's a real stretch. Uh, it just seems like a huge stretch. Okay. stretch and and I think we're going to have people concerned that we're not doing what we initially said we were going to do in the I, I, I think it's appropriate in terms of where we are now is that uh, we should be gathering whatever questions we have to make a decision if you, if you already have enough information to make a decision be prepared on the 11th is the way I would see it um, I don't know, but if there's information, then I think we ought to feel free to uh, engage the 
superintendent and administration around those uh, issues and questions. Do you have anything else at this point? Not this point. No. Uh, uh, well, I got well, hold on. Well, Cal's coughing up a lung, so I figured you know, in a moment. Well, I'm working with you. Okay. okay. Well, Cal, are you okay? We need to take a quick break for you. No. Thank <laughs> you. You have two cents? I do. Um, okay, so a couple things. Um, first, I just want to start by thanking the superintendent and their team for providing the amount of candor that you provided in starting this discussion. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, no matter which of you think it is. Uh, um, but I thought it was a very straightforward analysis, and I really appreciate it. Um, I want to just say it out loud, because I want to make sure I'm hearing correctly. If we threw caution to the wind in terms of any sort of financial, financial issues, and we just looked at the educational recommendation of the team, it would be to go to a 5, 6, 7, 8. Is that correct? Um, the, our, I want to highlight one part of that because I, I know you've brought it up in when, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, you brought it up each time you've uh, spoken about it, I think I've asked about it. I want to know if you see that there is there are advantages in a five, six, seven, eight model for support services to the students. So. I, I, get, I guess I'll state my bias that I believe that there are multiple educational models that would all work for our students, uh, given that we deliver them with rigor and with, with fidelity and uh, uh, integrity. Um, but support services, are there, is there advantage, is there an, uh, an advantage going five, six, seven, eight, or is this something you'd have to get back to? We probably have to get back to you um, with more explicit details, but the biggest advantage that uh, we looked at in the five, six, seven, eight, and we did go out to several districts uh, in our neighboring communities and outside of Cuyahoga County uh, in regards to the different models uh, that they had when we gathered our information in our first presentation um, to the board. Um, um, in the biggest advantage uh, for support services that we really looked at was when we looked at our strategic plan goal and we looked at goal number two around equity. Uh, that we would be looking at uh, goal number two and making sure that all of the students had equal opportunity to everything uh, that we can afford in the district. Uh, that it not just be at one middle school and not at another middle school, but bringing that together as a cohort so that we make sure that there's equitable distribution there. That was one of the biggest things we looked at in the five, six, seven, eight model. Do, do we feel that a five, six, seven, a five, six, seven, eight model would have operational cost savings versus the uh, six, seven, eight model? Uh, the one, the one study that we did do uh, quickly was transportation, and because of our student population being centralized for the majority of it. Um, a Roxborough Wiley didn't matter. Monticello does because it's, it's centralized. Your busing costs will increase if you have one, you know, one, an outlying school because now you're deciding to transport all those your uh, five, six, or to seven, eight to students to, to one of those uh, sites. So you're going to increase your uh, ridership, which is good because we're putting more students on a bus to get them safely to school, but it increase our cost. Now you're talking about transportation, but I guess I'm also asking about in terms of resources, teacher resources, uh, professional development resources. Is there a benefit to having five, six in one building and seven, eight in another building? There's also the discussion of seven, eight have different uh, uh, needs, physical education wise. Uh, are there operational cost savings beyond transportation, or is it, or is, or is it more uh, uh, operationally to go to five, six, seven, eight, or do we not know? Well, one of the things that we would be able to centralize is our professional development, and we could make sure that teachers in the 5-6 building uh, would be um, collaborating together. We could share resources. We can even allocate um, specific district resources, like our instructional specialists. They could be delivering professional development to all fifth grade teachers um, in one building instead of having to go to multiple buildings, try to schedule uh, their substitute costs that are always associated with pulling people out of buildings. 
and how that might impact uh, the climate of the building for the day. And so there are some operational costs that we, if we had it in a central location, we would be able to maximize um, district resources for a five, six, or a seven, eight. Uh, one of the other things, and maybe just to get to your previous question <coughs> around the support services, um, and I think that it goes back to the idea of we sometimes look at support services and we think about what are adults doing <coughs> for children. And I think that one of the untapped potentials when we talk about cohorting students um, as one tiger nation is how do we think about students being a support service to all the other students? So one of the things that we talk about is um, if we think about the Board of Education as, as an example, if I say, well, let's take half of you and we'll meet with you over there, and then we'll meet with the other half of you over here, we might think that that might decrease our efficiency because we've split our resources into two. Instead of saying, well, board meetings probably make the most sense when we have everybody in the same room, we get a chance to talk to each other, we get to have candid conversation, we get to share resources, and then by the time our meeting is done, we get a chance to really come out making sure that everybody's on board with the same ideas or educational philosophy. And I think that that's how we're even thinking about having all of our students in five, six, or seven, eight, is the opportunity to be together is going to maximize the teacher resource, the support services, and how students can become resources for each other. And now to add to that, Cal, we've also, I've heard from my colleagues about having additional resources for even counselors. You know, even our neighbors at Shaker have stated, well, Talisa, here's some benefits and, and, and things you really need to look at. And they propose maybe having more counselors for services for our students. Um, and so we've looked at, recognized that even with, as Felicia stated, when they went out and, and visited some of the other school districts. So yes, will those, um, will we have to use more resources for our students? Yes, but that is a, a cost that we know we're going to incur and we, and we want to. Uh, we, wanna, we already have dollars allocated for social and emotional services. Um, now we're, we have a task force looking at communities and schools. We want to provide wraparound services for our students and our families. So we're not going to shy away from providing additional services for our students. That's what we do. That's what we should be doing in our schools, providing those services for all of our students because we know that for this community, we have students from various backgrounds that are in our schools and our students need more services and we have to provide those regardless of the model. I mean, we stay the course, we're gonna make sure we provide these <coughs> services too. So, um, very good question and I think we're definitely gonna um, have to look at strategically and as we confer with our other uh, sister districts and others to make sure that we have the services our, our students need. Because the fifth graders would be with a, a group of students they were not normally with now. Um, <coughs> And, and, and what does that look like? They won't be the leaders in that school as the fifth graders in the elementary schools now, they go to with the sixth graders are. So, so a, a lot of the answers were more of an anecdotal nature, which I would have expected. I didn't yeah. warn you I was gonna ask. Um, I didn't know I was gonna ask. Um, <laughs> and I could anecdotally, I could anecdotally come to the conclusion that I could see reasons why outcomes would be better when you're when you're clustering on emotional uh, uh, levels and all. Do not take that as any expertise. That's just like I, I, on a logical level, it makes sense. I think if in fact the educational team feels that this is of significant benefit to the students of this district, then it behooves us to do a more in-depth analysis of. Are there, are there cost savings? Are there, do we see if we can, if we can in some way quantita quantify the, uh, uh, how outcomes, how we would expect outcomes to be more successful, more what we're looking for? Um, I'm not, I know that's a difficult task, but you know, when it comes down to it, that's, we have to know why going this, to this model would be the way to go, because as my colleagues have pointed out, there's some significant barriers to going to this model. Uh, um, I, I, I'm going to ask a question that has already somewhat been answered by being a surrogate for the people in the community have asked this question. In terms of the flexibility of buildings, people have asked me, well, what if you prepared the infrastructure in a building? So let's say we did 6, 7, 8 right now. You prepared the infrastructure so that you could, in a, in a larger sense, add a wing later on to, to make it into 5, 6, 7, 8. 
I realize we've answered, but could you just answer for the community in terms of, it, it, to the best of your ability? Sure. The, the, the question is, is um, you know, in the current model, two six and eight renovations, do we create an opportunity in some of the upgrades we're doing for a future addition, uh, if we were going to do so? And um, it's a challenge because the, the concept would be, you know, upsize some electrical equipment or add another air handler or upsize an air handler that would maybe handle a space that's going to be added in the future. So uh, it's something we could do, but we're very challenged on the budget right now. And, and what we're trying to do is, is maximize what we can put in those buildings. So th the answer is from a suitability for a future expansion, we are not right now setting ourselves in a position where we're oversizing any of the equipment right. or the or the infrastructure. And for that matter, we're not even changing the plumbing infrastructure. Um, so uh, that, that doesn't mean that you couldn't do a study of the buildings and say, where would we do it based on, you know, if we thought that was going to be, you know, uh, a consideration. However, it, <coughs> we're really constrained, I think, Cal, by the, the amount of money we have in, in trying to, again, make sure we, you know, finish the components that are currently on the plate. Okay, so I, I don't want to take up too much of it, so let me do one last thing. Um, um, and I think, actually, my colleagues have done a real nice job of sort of diagramming, and they were very involved in Issue 81. Um, um, I take a t slightly different approach, but I think Jim actually pointed out sort of both sides of the approach, so I appreciate that, uh, that uh, beginning. I think that we as a board can keep talking about what the, what the community is going to expect, and every time we say it, we're telling them what to expect. Um, we're, we're, we're actually saying, well, we said this when issue 81 was passed, but I will tell you as a community member, I'll, I'll, I'll take the seat on the other side of the room for a moment, that facts, as Jim pointed out, facts change. Facts, uh, there's, there's a dynamic qual uh, quality to what you know, and in education, as we've all seen, an educational model that's great today, two years from now, is going to be defined. They're, they're going to go on to a new educational model. There's going to be a new way to do things. It behooves us to at least look as much as, as closely as we can to what are the facts today. What, what is it that the educational team is telling us is in the best interest of our students? I'm not saying that means we change. I'm not saying that means we, we, we throw away what, what we originally said we were going to do, but I do think that this exercise is absolutely worthwhile. Um, I personally am not going to fear which buildings I do or don't decide on it. If I, find, if I feel that it is in the best interest of the students of this district and we can do it within our means, that's the recommendation I'll go to. Um, that is not foreshadowing. That is not saying that I've already decided on buildings. It simply means that I owe it to the students of this district to make, make the decision that it is in their best interest. So um, I, again, I think people will take that the way they want to take it. I just, all I want to say is that I really do feel like we need to think about what are the facts today? What, what is it we know about our student population? And what is it that we can, uh, uh, we feel we can do within our means? So, Brown, I'll, I'll stop now because I'm good. Okay. Okay, I'd just like to again thank the team for presenting this um, information to us again. But I was just um, wanted to propose a question to George in regards to transportation. If we look at this configuration, considering that the state is making cuts in transportation, and you said that would be a significant cost. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. You said that that would be a significant cost for transportation. It would be, I don't think it, it depends what you mean significant. It's going to be a cost increase because we will have to transport more students. Now, depending on where those students live, uh, would be a guessing game right now. And, okay. and it, we'd have to determine, we ran a couple scenarios mm -hmm. just off of our current student population, and it, it would depend which school was picked for the five, six, which one was the seven, eight. And there, there's actually a potential to it be a wash if we can maximize routes. Mm -hmm. um, depends if we stuck with the two mile <coughs> limit. If we went with the elementary schools to the, the two-mile limit, uh, there was a discussion about the fifth grade, where, where are we going to put them with the elementary, with the middle school distance. There, so there's a lot of different outliers that will affect that final cost. 
but we are pretty certain that there will be a need for increase. I mean, you, you were, we're taking that center populace and saying you're go we're going to take a whole group of those students now instead of taking them to, uh, some to Monticello and some to Rocks Middle, we're going to say we're going to take the majority of one of those buildings. It's, it's going to increase our need to be very thrifty with the routing, but we expect to have to have uh, additional buses. And a lot of it depends on the decisions that are made, and if we decide to go definitely down that road, we can do more homework and, and project out, but it, it, takes, it takes some effort and some work. Okay. But we are confident that it's either a wash or an increasing busing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I've got, uh, I, I guess I struggle with the social emotional development. Um, and, and it seems like there's a magical time <coughs> when um, it's better for some kids. Like, it seems that one of the things that we might be saying is that from a social-emotional standpoint, it's better for a fifth grader to be with a sixth grader than to be with third and fourth graders. Is that, I mean, am I hearing that or am I <coughs> over-projecting? So I think that when we talk about the continuum of learning, especially as it relates to reading and math, then mm -hmm. there are things that at a lower elementary K-4, it's about those foundational pieces versus being able to use your reading and writing skills for communication or for some other um, more strenuous academic exercises. And then when you think about the child themselves, the, the path where a child starts to begin to, to come into themselves comes around the fifth and sixth grade um, years uh, where they start thinking about self-awareness, where they're trying to figure themselves out, they're going through puberty, those type of things. Um, so, I guess it goes back to Carol's point, uh, Cal's point then in terms of the kind of support we need to be looking at for those kids. I mean, the support that we give a sixth grader now, we probably should always have been given the fifth grader that support as well. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. Am I hearing it right? Correct. Okay. I got it. Okay. Um, Pat, okay, now I've, I know I've asked for this before, both at the board meeting as well as our private meetings. I would like a timeline that tells me, based upon current information from the state, I can gain, because I've had conversations with folks who are questioning. Right now, the way the funding works is that theoretically we get our 14% from the state of Ohio when we finish phase one and we pass phase two. And that's paid to us during construction of phase two, correct? As you spend down phase two, you get your share that they've determined <coughs> is, is exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now my question would be then, now the other component working backwards from that is, we have to create a new master, or a plan for phase two, the state has to sign off on that, then we have to wait for the state to go through everybody else on their list and see, they dole out their money, then based upon the formula, see when we're eligible, and when we would be eligible for, for those dollars. Right. So, fit for, so Theoretically, then, the, the, to get the money from the state for phase one and for phase two, we have to wait phase, we have to hold up phase two until the state says we can do phase two, unless we go to the ballot and say, oh, forget about it, we're going to put a bond issue on to get the money. Is that correct? Right. Okay, so my question would be, based upon the current formulations, if we said, okay, we're going to redo our master plan for phase two, let's say we let's say we kick, set our current path, and in 2000, in January 2019, we figure let's begin a new, we'll do a, pro, a process like we did for before. And we take a year, so then in January <coughs> 2020, the plan's done, the board signs off on it, we send it to the state. When would be the earliest we could expect the state to say yes, your kosher, your, your plan's kosher, you're good to go? Do they take? Is it like a month? Is it a year? Is it? Or do we have no idea? Generating a master plan in conjunction with the Ohio Facilities Construction <coughs> Commission, and they have, they have uh, quite a few planners. Uh, they're very busy right now because a lot of folks right. got funding in November. But um, that process is it's not it's not like a year process. It's a you know maybe a six month process. But what part of what they'll tell you too is 
they're going to reevaluate it when you do when right. you come your number comes up on the equity list. They're going to go back and look at it again and say, hey, has your student population changed? Right. Is everything still good? Um, you know, how did things go in your current <coughs> one? And, and so it's um, you could agree you could have a plan that you agree to right now for phase two, but by the time you get there, it's going to it's going to be impacted by. A, a wide range of changes. Well, I guess so. When, when, where I'm going with this, then, okay, let's say it's, it's 2020. We give our, we send our plan down to Columbus in January. Come the middle of the year, they come back and say, "Yes, your plan's great. Fine. Now we have to pay, now. It's correct me if I'm wrong. Funding is conditional upon us passing an issue. Correct. Well, first you have to get your number has to be up on the equity list. They okay, so then, then, then we have to eligible. wait. Then we have to wait for them to say we're eligible. Yeah. So we have no idea when that would be. We're, uh, I think we're 499 on the equity list. Well, no, but they have to go. My so they're not, uh, I don't think they're into the fours yet. But my understanding, yeah, my, well, wait, that correction may have run. My understanding was there's a set amount of money. <coughs> they go through the, if the 498 above them either aren't ready to go or there's money left over, they pick 10, they have money for 11. Then our number would come up. Correct? Well, they also then go back to people that lapsed before and said, "Hey, you know, two seventy-five. You guys good or not good?" I, I understand that, but what I'm saying then is, I guess what I, where I'm trying to get that is, we have no idea when our number will be viable for phase two from the state. The, when we've posed the question in our quarterly meetings with right. the folks from the state, typically we hear an answer that's about five years from now. Right, which goes back to why Jim always says it's always five years away. The question I'm posing then is, if we're always five years away, it's like Sisyphus put, pushing the rock up the hill. So I, what I'm trying to get that, <coughs> what you're saying then is, and you're our owner's rep, and I'm looking to you for, you know, we have no ability to say when we will have the matching dollars from the state for phase two. Again, there's a lot of variables. It depends on when other people pass, but it, it's um, five years would probably be as you, as you noted, and that, that's what we heard two years ago, three years ago. So it, it, it's very difficult to, to determine that because it's also dependent on, on the state continuing to fund that program. You know, so it's a really so our, challenging well, calculation. I, I appreciate your, your inability to let me nail, nail you down on this, um, but I'm going to get there. What you're saying then is, now when you say five years, <coughs> it's five years from when we submit the plan versus five years from today. Well, now, it's, it, the, when you submit the plan is, is is really not the most relevant factor. It's when the state has right. the money and your number comes up. But I, I don't want to belabor this, because, but I'm trying to get an answer. What I'm saying that, what you're saying then is, because of all the ver moving parts and variables combined, there is no ability for us to set with any specific definitive, definitive, there's no way for us to say specifically when we can expect the state to give their blessing for phase two to go on the ballot for dollars for phase two. Right. That's, that's really hard to have a high level of certainty of when you, you wouldn't say, I think it's 2023, 20, 24, 25, it's... So it's, it's a, basically it's a moving target that correct. we cannot set a date for. Yes. Then the question I would pose upon that is, then if the Board of Education, a future Board of Education said, hey, you know what, we don't want to wait for the state anymore, we're going to pay full fare keeping in mind that part of the rationale for phase one was to use the monies from phase one to pay the cost of phase two. The board says, you know what, forget about it, we're going to do it on our own. If we passed a bond issue separate from our programs, build the buildings, would we still then be able to get matching dollars from the state, assuming for, for the state the square footage that is applicable by their criteria? You, you still have to wait till you get down on the list but, you know, but, when your number comes up. So what I'm saying you is have if, a large if, credit if, we're, if, there we're <coughs> if we're tired of waiting, it's, it's 2025 and we're tired of waiting and we go on the ballot. Yeah, I, you know, again, um, I, I believe that you, you know, again, you, you're, what you're doing is developing a credit that when they say, okay, it's time for your funding, if you already spent your share, then they say, okay, then now we owe you our share. In that case then, if we, I'm going to, again, I'm throwing out a hypothetical, theoretical, because we're supposed to be gaming stuff out. If we are on the ballot, and I'm making a number up, it's a, it's a, let's say, I'm going to make a low number. It's $75. You put a $75 bond issue on, and that'll pass, because it's a real low millage. We pass the bond issue. We get, seven, we spend $75. We have, we have, the, that's, then the state says, okay, you know what, we now owe you $25. We, do we get a, does, does Ed McMahon come with a big check, and we get a check? Or, you know, and then if we get a 25, let's say we get 25 million, a $25 check, do we have to pay, how do, what happens to that money then? 
Well, a lot of things happen. First of all, you know, they, they're going to go back and look at what would they have funded by the time you come up with a list. And that number always, because you know, right. even if we lose 100 students, and there may be other changes to the legislation of what they fund and what they don't fund, it, um, but I, I don't know of any district that's been in that situation. Okay. You know that where they did all of the work, okay. and then the state owed the money. But I, you know, as I understand the program, that would in theory be the <coughs> then. For, then forget the, the the hypotheticals that if you got a check for twenty five, you go pay down your bonds or you put in other PI issues. The problem, the issue I'm getting at, I guess what I'm really trying to zero in on is we have no idea when the state will prove that we could go on for funding for phase two, or when we would get our matching dollars for them at the present time and the target continually moves so for us to say that we have a, we have any idea of when we will do, be able to achieve phase two with <coughs> so long as we make it contingent upon the state approval we don't know when that will be i, I would agree with that okay yeah. so basically if we want any time our ability to create any kind of significant definitive timeline for phase two requires us to commit to spending dollars without knowing about the state it would sound like. Yeah, again, if you want to, if you want to tie your funding to the state, then it's uh, it's closer to an indefinite time frame. Right. That it, you know, it could be five okay. years, it could be ten years. Okay, that was my question on that. Um, I, I would appreciate we if we're supposed to be making a decision in a couple of weeks. If I, you know, Jim, or not John, George mentioned uh, gaming out uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see uh, Jim men uh, Cal mention it. If you have any analyses and reports in regard to cost savings, cost benefits. I know staff members have mentioned discussing this with their colleagues of peer history. <coughs> any information in regard to that? Because I know we received a couple of handouts and we have the PowerPoint, but any other additional detailed information you can have in regard to the upper and lower, I would appreciate, because I, I mean, we've received a few things, but I haven't seen any other. Specifically with the five, six, seven, eight? Well, yes. And you want us to determine using both buildings? Well, you had said you ran the, the numbers. They ran some variables, right? Yeah, I'm just, I I'm just share curious. That yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm looking if you're talking to five, six, seven, eight. Um, the, then you, if you're talking cost savings, um, the other question, I, 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 some information in regard to, you know, we keep talking about the master facilities plan. As the person on the committee who created the options for the, that the <coughs> LLC signed off on and the board approved, let me state specifically, when we, there was two components, one, and Jim noted before, we said, keep the current configuration, that's a board decision, it wasn't a lay, people, lay citizen's decision. The second component was when we gamed out an upper and lower model, it was specifically in regard to perceptions between the two buildings that go back 75, 80 years. We did not game out the impact it would have on elementary enrollment, <coughs> and the motivator was in regard to perceptions, but also the key element was that was assuming that the project was going to remove the additions to the two buildings and build new construction to replace it that would allow for if you wanted to go upper and lower in the future. That was the impetus from the recommendation from the Buildings Committee of the Late Facilities Committee. The other, a lot of the other stuff we talked about here, which I know my colleague is always talking about, we did not entertain or discuss that. This was purely a bricks and sticks building issue. So I, I bring that up because that was what the Buildings Committee did. And if anybody is telling staff <coughs> otherwise, I don't know that they know what they're speaking about because as the person who was running that committee, I know it's empirically and specifically, um, that was the intent. We did not explore curriculum. We did not explore, explore uh, socialization. We were exploring perception. And again, the assumption at that time was all new, removing the additions to allow the capacity. That was the original vision. So, I, that, Mr. President. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, I think we need some clarity on this whole decision-making process that's going to happen between now and July 11th. <coughs> um, I mean, there's... <coughs> I mean, it doesn't seem to me that we're really deciding at that point. I mean, the only thing that I think we're really deciding is do we just sort of stay the course? Right. If we don't stay the course, really, it's, is it a totally blank canvas or is it just limited in what I'm seeing on this piece of paper? 
on well, the decision. If we don't stay the course, then the door opens to listen to options beyond anything. Could be beyond anything we've already heard, or it could be including what we've already heard. But if, you, if we decide not to go with the six, seven, eight, that's the question: to go with the six, seven, eight, or not go with the six, seven, eight. So, because well, okay, well, with with this sort of well, what's going through my head is so we um, <coughs> decide to open up the door. Okay. Okay. Hypothetically. Okay. Um, but then through this process, we decide that we just don't have the money to do the five, six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. We yep. just really because can't go back to what we wanted to do to stay the course because we've got time issues and we've got less money available to us well, to do that. I don't know that we're in any different place than we are right now. In other words, if we, we're talking two weeks. So if, if what, what I'm hearing, and, and uh, Dr. Dixon, you and your team could clarify this, is that if we decide to stay the course, we just pick up right there Correct. and continue. Correct. If we decide not to stay the course, we have from July 11th to December 15th to decide where we're headed. Well, don't we have to make a decision? We also have this up, this all in. We also have there's two options. I see there's three. There's stay the course. There's stay the course, high on one building, low on the other, and then there's upper, then open the door. I mean, my understanding is from the decision making model. Well, it's it's, it's two options. You stay the course, right? Or you open it up for another option. But well, so so, okay, so regardless of the other option, it is you open the door for another. option. But I guess okay. So basically, the up the high low model is considered an option. Know, that's that's considered with all the other options. Correct. Okay. But any 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 delay is two million dollars. Correct. I mean, okay. we, we've right. stated that. So right. if we if we decide on July 11th right. to stay the course, right. we will continue with our six seven eight buildings, and we will get if we go back to those screens right. or those okay. items that we will have yeah. our two six eight buildings. We'll have those items, gotcha. and we move forward with our plan. If we decide a different pathway, okay. then those are some things we have to consider, and we have to make the decision by December fifth. Okay. And we we've, we've stated, um, you know, I continue to beat that horse. We we do know that it's going to uh, potentially delay. It will delay the opening. There will be some additional costs. Um, so we know those. Um, those variables, but we also know, and I think it was important for us to state to the public that if we continue on the current pathway, what we will get in those buildings is important for us to let the community know because there was um, this notion that our two middle schools were going to look as grand as our two high, as our high school. And we wanted the community to know that that would, that would not happen that with our current budget realities, that our two middle schools would not look like our new high school. So our two middle schools will have those modest or light renovations if we move, if we move forward. Yeah, but I mean, I think the reality though is if we had the forty million or the oh, thirty-eight I, yeah, million, yeah, I agree. Oh, no, it, no. Was, it would never have yeah. the same Ex level of yeah. Uh, um, agreed, but I just want to make sure that there was a notion, as you heard, that you know people there's so people thinking that we were going to have something other than what we're, the reality is that we're not. Not that we're not going to have good educational programs in our six, seven, eight. Of course, we're going to have good educational programs in our six, seven, eight buildings. So we're not saying at all that if we go with a different model, <coughs> that we're not going to the kids in our current middle schools are going to have something less. That's well, not what we're saying. But we are saying that if we have an opportunity to do something different because we have budget constraints and we want to say this, think forward, say, okay, we know we have some budget constraints. Do we want to go ahead and push a, a different model, knowing we have some budget constraints, knowing we may have to make some different decisions, let's rethink it and put that option back forward to the board. So. 
on July 11th. If you say to us, Dr. Dixon, your team, we want to move forward with this. We'll move forward with this. We will also take in consideration some of the other factors we've talked about, making sure we strengthen our education design for our six, seven, eight um, students. And we will look again, have Pat and his team look again at, at some flexible space. What would that cost us? we will cost it out. What would it cost us to have flexible space to revisit this again at a later date? That's what we would do, and we will bring that information. Um, we will provide that information for you prior to the July 11th meeting. So July 11th is a regular meeting. It's a regular meeting. Yeah, we're skipping the fourth. Yeah, we moved but it from the fourth to uh, I know. Yeah, we pushed it back. Because this meeting, our schedule was a little off. This meeting actually was supposed to be last weekend, last week rather, but we moved to this week, so that pushed next week's meeting to the following week. Well, I mean, I think for the 11th, we have to assume there is going to be a, a high volume of public comment. The perhaps, and okay. we also have stated to come if they, if people wanted to send their comments to the board members as of today. Until that point, they, the public can also send their comments and concerns to the board. At, yeah, and then well, yes, and we have public comments on that night. Just we will. Um, well, I think we just need to be prepared for it. So therefore, yeah. I think we need to Back be here. here. Yes. Okay. Um, if we have other business to dis discuss at that time, beyond this. Well, it's a regular board meeting, so there will be our regular personnel business. And, and one reason we had some business tonight is because the summer is, you know, we have a lot of the personnel stuff that happens in the summer because of hiring. So we will have a small amount of business um, that we would have, because it'll be a regular business meeting, well, but I, we will I have get it that, open but for um, I mean, this comments. is sort of overshadowing. I mean, this is, I mean, I'm up for the challenge. I think everybody here is up for the challenge, okay? But it's going to be a big meeting. It's going to be a long meeting. I don't care how long it is. I think we just need to be prepared for that. Um, and um, I, mean, I think there's a lot of things we're going to have to go over and, and get another presentation from your team to fill in all the, uh, the gaps and the, uh, the likely additional questions we're going to be uh, yeah, I think getting I, from you or getting to you in the meantime. Yeah, and I think we've got to be feeding those questions to <coughs> the administration. We've got to be feeding the questions to them. I'm disagreeable. Okay. Anything else? Again, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Mr. Mr. Posh. Yes. Mr. Register. Yes. Mr. Silverman. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Zucker. Yes. 